Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, it's the 10th of April. I'm Tom Glasson. Welcome to The Roast. Hey, it says teen drinking's in decline. I'm so out of touch. Wait, Tarzos are still cool, right? Like, we still collect Tarzos. No. Oh, cowabunga. Wrong. Tonight on The Roast, teen drinking is in decline and Bob Carr releases excerpts from his memoirs. So while we find a new TV that hasn't been filled with beer, we'll cross to Mark Humphreys with the headlines. Retailer David Jones looks set to be taken over with a South African retail group offering a $2.15 billion bid. So just to clarify, David Jones, an Australian icon and oldest department store in the world, worth $2 billion. Thing you play on the toilet, $7 billion. The bid came from Woolworths Holdings and its CEO Ian Moyer, seen here being photobombed by a mannequin, believes that despite falling sales, there is a future in retail. The department store isn't dead. Um, mediocrity is dead. Retailing it is dead. You hear that? Mediocre departments of David Jones? I'm looking at you, Electronics Department. Your days are numbered. Though I will miss you charging me $45 for a CD trapped in a case that can only be opened by giant skeleton key. If the deal goes ahead, it will be the biggest takeover of a shop I only go to at Christmas time. Alex Perry, fashion designer and skeptic of top buttons, has apologised for using an extremely thin model at Sydney's Fashion Week. Perry failed to notice how thin the model was, blaming a serious lapse of judgement. Though I think he just couldn't remember where he put his glasses. The model, Cassie Vanden Dungan, has defended her appearance, posting photos of her meals on Instagram. Love catering at Fashion Week. Hashtag love my job. Hashtag love food. Hashtag I am who I am. Hashtag deal with it. It's sad that the industry made her feel the need to prove that she eats food, but a word of advice to models, if you are trying to convince people you eat food, don't take photos of uneaten food. It's a contentious issue. On the one hand, we want an open discourse about body image. On the other, we want fewer photos of food on Instagram. A new extensive study of homeopathy by Australia's National Health and Medical Research Council has concluded it's a load of shit. Homeopathy is one of the most popular forms of alternative medicine, a category of medicine distinguished from usual medicine by not being medicine. Now, I would explain to you how homeopathy treatment works, but it doesn't work, so I can't. John Dwyer, Emeritus President of Medicine at UNSW, says the homeopathy industry has not got a leg to stand on. But homeopaths, who believe in the principle of like cures like, will no doubt cure that missing leg with a few milliliters of diluted leg. Dr Nicholas Zepps, who extensively researched homeopathy, says the evidence suggests users of the treatment are wasting their money. But Sarah from Bikram Yoga says it's definitely worth it. So who knows what to believe? For the roast, I'm Mark Humphreys. Thank you, Mark. Well, first up tonight, former Foreign Minister Bob Carr has released excerpts of his memoirs to the public. And we actually have an advanced copy of the whole book, but given it is 502 pages long, it'd take 50 roasts just to get through it. So we'll stick to the highlights. Thank you, Tom. 502 pages. I'm going to need a minute. Well, you can have half of one. Now, the book is a day-by-day -day diary of Bob Carr's time as foreign minister, which obviously was a job that required quite a bit of foreign travel, and it took its toll. As he noted, business class, no edible food, no airline pyjamas, I lie in my tailored suit. And i got to say, that sounds less like a diplomatic journal and more like something I heard at Slam Poetry last night. Business class, no edible food, no airline pyjamas, I lie in my tailored suit, crumpled, Crinkled, ruined, the suit or me, both. Thank you, uh, my poems are available in the Quinoa Lounge. Peace and love. Business class sounds like a nightmare. And so does that Quinoa bar. Yeah, it gets worse, Tom. According to Carr, the sleeping pods were arranged in a design that owes a lot to the transatlantic slave trade. You think that's a bit hyperbolic? I think it's a little like a Stephen McQueen film. He was born a free man. He grew up a free man. He was never not a free man. But one time when he flew business class, he wasn't even given free pajamas. I thought it would have knocked about two years off my life. Bob Carr is 12 hours a slave. I tell you what, I prefer first class anytime, anytime. And if you thought flying business class was doing it tough, 
well, you're probably Bob Carr, but it's nothing compared to the horrors of flying first class. After one particular nightmare, Bob Carr rightly complained and received this apology from Singapore Airlines as regional vice president. Please accept my sincere apology if any part of our first class in-flight offering fell below your expectations. Specifically, I have taken note of the lack of English subtitles for the Wagner opera Siegfried. Oh, poor Bob Carr. Nothing ruins the majesty of watching German opera on a tiny screen with shitty headphones and a pressurised flying humidor like not being able to read along with the singers. But it's not just complaints. No, Carr also makes a lot of bold declarations, like how he felt sitting in a room with world leaders Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin. I cannot feel humble. Interested? Curious, of course. Just not humble. And just how not humble is Bob Carr? I am foreign minister. I soar above the mundane and serve my country. Honestly, this guy is the Kanye West of Australian politics. Everything he does is the best thing anyone's ever done, even when he's not trying. Unintended brilliance by me to be in Laos and Thailand this week. Nobody in the media could trap me on leadership. You see, what anyone else calls good luck, Bob Carr calls unintended brilliance. Now, whoa! It almost hit us. A bit of unintended brilliance to not be standing there. Of course, given it's 502 pages long and Carr was only in office 18 months, you can't help but feel he was writing this thing on the go. And that his publishers do not know how to market Carr. He says he has more energy than 16 gladiators. His ambition is to have a concave abdomen defined by deep cut obliques. Based off these quotes, it's my understanding this is the memoir of an unintentionally brilliant jet-setting gladiator slave who is really ripped and loves Wagner. Now the front cover shouldn't be this, it should be this. Now that's a front cover that would shift some units. I'm going to go talk to his publisher. And it's a good note for future writers of memoirs. Since most politicians seem to release memoirs after leaving office, it's hard not to think that everyone in Parliament is just a walking, talking draft autobiography. April 9th, and the monotony of parliamentary life washes over me with pathos afresh. Hmm. <sighs> April 10th, had a muffin from the parliamentary cafeteria. Pretty sure it was a bran muffin. Could have been oat. I continue to strive for brilliance amidst ceaseless mediocrity. Afternoon. What are you working on? Diary of a Shadow Minister for Fisheries. You? Diary of the Minister for Fisheries. As I urinated between the Minister and Shadow Minister for Fisheries, I was struck by how amazing my book title was. Diary of a Finance Minister. An amazing moment in the men's room. And with all these disclosures and revelations, you start to realise no one ever speaks their mind or says what's really going on while they're in office. It's always three years after the fact that you get the good stuff. If you want to find out what's happening in Parliament now, you need Tony Abbott's 2017 autobiography. And for that, we'll cross to Alex Lee in the not too distant future. Tom, I'm in the year 2017, having just read Tony Abbott's political memoirs, Diary of a Cyclist and the 28th Prime Minister of Australia. Now, this explosive account of Abbott's time in office and peddling around his office shows that everything you know about politics in your time is completely wrong. The intrigue, the double dealing and who's in the closet will astound you, but you'll have to wait till none of this matters before you hear these stories. What, you won't tell me anything that's in it? No, I won't. All I can say is beware 8.19pm 10th of April 2014. But that's today and that's almost now. Um, we'll be right back. Thanks, Tom. Hey, guys, have you ever received an ominous warning from the future? Was it a message from a time-travelling reporter? If so, what did Alex say would happen to you? Why don't you jump on our Twitter now and tell us, because we'd love to hear about it. At The Roast TV or hashtag Roast TV. Finally tonight, a new report by the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, aka the best place to do work experience, has revealed that fewer and fewer adolescents are drinking alcohol. So, our worst fear has been realised, the next generation is a bunch of losers. A bunch of losers that's going to get shit done. The report's author, Dr Michael Livingston, seen here wearing the face of someone who'll be showing his ID to bouncers for the rest of his life, says that today's teetotaling teens are more concerned about the risks of drinking. Teenagers are more aware of things like the, the risks to, the, to their brains as they're developing. But what they don't seem to be aware of is the damaging side effects of not drinking, including not being able to dance, talk to members of the opposite sex, or get their first sexual encounter out of the way. But what are they doing instead? Well, according to Doogie Howser MD... 
Engaging in online activities, social networking and gaming is associated with less drinking. Online gaming instead of drinking? Gaming's lame. You can't drink an Atari. Atari? Seriously, Tom, how old are you? No, the truth is, it is you who is lame. Hmm. Computer games have advanced since you used to play Pong by yourself. They've advanced since this morning. And the people who play them are now the norm. We're the cool kids. The age of you is over, Tom. Surely spending your Friday night alone in a room playing computer games isn't healthy either, so why is it so popular? Because when I'm roaming the hills of Skyrim, slaying dragons to absorb their shouts and being tasked by the Greybeards to track down the legendary horn of Jürgen Windcaller, I am a god. The world humbles itself before my exquisite bow of burning. I mean, sure, I could get a similar high from drinking, but the difference is, after a big night of skyrimming, I don't wake up in the gutter caked in my own shame. Your shame? The shame is my shit, Tom. Oh. Oh, I think I hear an ogre attacking Riverwood. I've got sky to rim. All right. Well, is it possible that the hours spent in front of a computer instead of going out drinking can actually benefit your image over time? For more on this, we'll cross to Alex Lee. Alex? Tom, I'm here inside your Facebook profile. No! And some of the images I'm seeing here are pretty shocking. Tagged and captured here, we can see a detailed account of the events that unfolded on January the 24th. January 24th? I don't remember what happened on January 24th. Well, you might not remember, but Facebook does. To recap the night's events, you got progressively more drunk throughout the evening, quickly bypassing the drunk enough to be confident but still in control stage, and going straight to the publicly embarrassing stage of not having a clue what's going on but still thinking you're cool. Now, witnesses have described the event as, you've got a problem, Tom, you monster, and you weren't even invited to my child's baptism. God. But to be fair, the alcohol that got me to that stage also helped me forget it ever happened. Well, these teens are onto something, Tom. One of the biggest risks of binge drinking is that you'll be captured forever on social media. Yeah, I think we'll probably leave it there, Alex. Thank you very much. Doing body shots of sacramental wine. <laughs> OK. Unfriend. Oh, wait. I forgot to ask her what happens at 8.19. Oh, God. It's 8.19 now. Tom, before we go, let me read you the remaining 376 pages of this book. No, they're not. In my tailored pinstripe navy You know what? I'm going to stop what? you there. I've got somewhere to go. You know, Tom, I don't usually let people speak to the last dragonborn like that. Yeah, well, it's not a real name, so it's not a problem. Basil Good night. I'd cobbled together a four-point plan to give Arabs an alternative to demonstrations in the streets. <laughs>